Welcome, you are watching, The End Time Revival. Today, we are looking at the story of the Servant of God. Leonard Ravenhill, he was born in Leeds, Yorkshire, England. Born in 18th of June, 1907. Born into a godly family. His father was a preacher, who surrendered his life to Christ when Leonard was five years old. His father's level of spirituality and devotion to the Lord challenged Leonard a lot. His father was a local street preacher and won many souls to the Lord in streets, homes, and hospitals of their area. One of his favorite times to preach was at 10 p.m. outside the bars. That got him arrested a couple of times. Leonard fully surrendered his life to Christ when he was 14 years old. It wasn't sin that made him to fully surrender his life to Christ but rather he saw that his father had a spiritual reality that he himself did not have. His father had a deep relationship with God that Leonard would see him at times weep for joy while blessing their evening family meal and his mom sing hymns in the trials of life. May we have many dads like that, who can challenge the children with their holy living. At the age of 20, sensing the call of God upon his life, he attended Cliff College, a school of ministry in England. After three semesters he and his friends, walked the length and breadth of England, carrying their sleeping bags and preaching wherever they went. As they moved through towns, they saw churches which were desperately cold and they preached Christ everywhere. Some granted them permission to speak while some kicked them out and rejected them. However this faithful men stood strong and continued preaching the word throughout the country. In 1939, he married an Irish nurse, Martha. He had three sons. All of them, grew up to serve the Lord. They grew up in the ways of the Lord. David who was one of Leonard's son in his account of how they were brought up, he said, my mother was a real fanatic about family devotions. Dad was traveling regularly and she would read the Bible with us or some missionary story. We would always have a short devotional time before going to school, reading either a portion of scripture or from a devotional book and then brief prayer. There were times when I thought to myself, man, we're going to be late and miss the bus. But she would not compromise. Also one of Leonard's sons one time found a note written by their father. It was a prayer to God, telling God the kind of a son he want to have from God. Making it clear that Leonard regularly prayed for his sons, no wonder why all his sons feared and served the Lord. One of his terrible experiences he had, was when he was at a hotel and fire broke out in the hotel. And the three-story fall made him to suffer pain almost all his life and laying at the hospital for several months. He was known as a man of prayer, and it was common for him to pray as much as four, six or eight hours a day. He loved and collected books. He loved more to study past revivals, biographies, autobiographies, hymnals, and all the classic Christian writings. In his messages, he preached the truth plainly without fear of men or fear of criticism. Most of his messages he emphasized on holiness, repentance, prayer and revival. Because of his uncompromising and straightforward messages, some members found his message offensive, many times where he was invited to preach, he was never invited again. His messages will always challenge you to do more for God. Some pastors accused him of being too extreme and exaggerating in his messages and he responded by saying, many pastors criticize me for taking the gospel so seriously. But do they really think that on judgment day, Christ will chastise me, saying, Leonard, you took me too seriously. Quote dot. Leonard Ravenhill has also a huge impact on many Christian leaders who are famous today and also making an impact around the world. Leaders like, David Wilkerson, Michael L. Brown, Paul Washer, Ravi Zacharias, and Charles Stanley. He also had a close relationship with great leaders like A. W. Tozer and Vance Hauerner. Ravi Zacharias said about him, Ravenhill's writing, more than any other single influence during my Bible college years, shaped my thinking about prayer, preaching and the importance of getting near to God. In a video of Paul Washer recommending the book, In Light of Eternity, The Life of Leonard Ravenhill, spoke of how Leonard had such a tremendous impact upon his life. This is what he said, Leonard Ravenhill had such a tremendous impact upon my life as a young man, a young Christian. I had the privilege of reading many of his books, of listening to many of his sermons. But I also had the privilege of listening to him preach live in the congregation and also a few conversations with him. And I can tell you that this man walked with God. And I don't say that lightly. Not at all. He truly walked with God. And he was a man of prayer. In a day where ministers are sending out questionnaires to discover what people want to hear, and what they want out of a church. Leonard Ravenhill is refreshing. 
He only wanted to know what God wanted the people to know. And that's what made him so prophetic and so useful in God's economy. I was introduced to Leonard Ravenhill at the very beginning of my Christian pilgrimage. And the impact of his life upon mine remains unto this day. He lived as one who dwelt in the shadow of the Almighty, and he preached as one sent from God. He knew God's presence, wore his mantle, bore his burdens, and spoke his truth. He was the rarest of commodities in his day, and in ours. He was a man of God and his legacy continues in people like me, so many of my friends, so many of the seminary students that were friends of mine and college students. We used to gather together just to go listen to him. It was always exciting to hear that Leonard Ravenhill was in town, because you knew that he was going to tell you the truth. And you knew that he was going to bring you something from God. I guess one of the greatest impacts that Leonard Ravenhill had on my life was with regard to prayer and the power of God. Like E.M. Bounds, like George Mueller, like Robert Murray McChen, he was a man of prayer. And he taught us that every battle had to be won on our knees. Not in the pulpit, not in activity, not in ministry, but before God. And he taught us that a man needed God's seal, God's approval upon his life. And that although we need to study the scriptures and memorize the scriptures and concern ourselves with the purest, most pristine theology, we must have the power of God upon our lives. It's an absolute essential an absolute essential. Many of the young men that are around me, they're all very serious about church history and systematic theology and Greek and Hebrew and all those things that are so very important, expository preaching. But when it's all said and done, I ask them, the things Ravenhill used to ask us. How many hours on your knees? How much do you pray? You know about God. Do you know God? Do you know him? Quote dot. A. W. Tozer said this about him, those who know of Leonard Ravenhill recognize in him the religious specialist, the man sent from God to battle the priest of Baal on their own mountaintop, to shame the careless priest at the altar, to face the false prophet, and to warn the people who are being led astray by him. Such a man as this is not an easy companion. He insists on being a Christian all the time and everywhere. That marks him out as different. Why do we have men of such fiery swords as Ravenhill? They are sick inside when they see the children of heaven acting like the sons of earth. To such men as these, the church owes a debt too heavy to pay. Rick Joyner also in his weekly devotions, he shared about his experience with Leonard, he said. I met Leonard Ravenhill in late 1987 when speaking at a conference in Palestine, Texas. He came in with an entourage while I was speaking. I could tell by the response of the audience that he was someone of importance, but what really got my attention was when the voice of the Lord announced to me who had just entered. He said that this was a modern Simeon who had waited long and prayed much for the consolation of God in his times, and that he had been given the honor of beholding and prophesying over the last day ministry in its infancy. When I finished speaking and went to meet him, still not knowing his name, I shared with him what I had been told when he entered. We became friends, and I treasured the letters I used to get from Ravenhill. I enjoyed being able to sit with him in his home where there always seemed to be remarkable Christians gathered to hear his wisdom. I introduced Ravenhill to Mike Bickle and Bob Jones, who immediately asked him to come to Kansas City to speak. That was the first time I had seen Leonard speak to a large audience, and I was amazed to see so many peel out of their chairs and fall on their faces before the Lord. He was immediately adopted by everyone there as their father. When Mike wanted to introduce Leonard to John Wimber, the leader of the Vineyard Movement, I was skeptical because these two were so different. I was amazed at how fast John and Leonard bonded at their first meeting. I was even more amazed when John asked Leonard to share at the Anaheim Vineyard. Then John decided to host him at a special holiness conference, and I knew I had to be there to witness it. Again, Leonard had hardly begun to speak when people started to fall on their faces before the Lord. Soon there were more on the floor than in the seats, and the groans of repentance began to drown out Leonard's frail voice. Leonard was a brilliant preacher, but it was not his words that were causing this response, rather the Holy Spirit moving in conviction. People were getting free of old yokes, and the love and devotion to the Lord and his cross came upon them. As I watched, I felt that I was beholding the perfect marriage between grace, the vineyard movement, and truth, the holiness movement. These two really needed each other, and they had met and kissed. It was an important sign of what the last day ministry is going to look like. Leonard Ravenhill also wrote seven books and compiled an eight. They are, Why Revival Tarries, Revival Praying, Tried and Transfigured, Sodom had no Bible, America is too young to die, revival God's way. 
His books made lot of impact, especially the book, Why Revival Tarries, it was printed in many other languages and Ravenhill did not accept financial gain from his books but rather all the royalties on all his books go to missions. you perceive, Brother Ravenhill, to be the greatest need in the church in America specifically today? I won't give you my opinion. I'll give you a Bible opinion from Jeremiah chapter one, 2, verse 13. My people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. It's amazing to me when every pastor that comes Oh, I'm in a mega church, you know, we get 4,000 Sunday night, got nothing to do with your church. Every church in America nearly is filled Sunday morning. How many people do you have in your prayer meeting? The prayer meeting has almost died. Not just in Presbyterian churches, but in Pentecostal churches, in Baptist churches. I have a prayer meeting Thursday morning for, for pastors, about 20 come. Some come 200 miles, some come 300 miles round trip. And the last five or six weeks we've all ended up on the floor in tears praying for one thing, revival. Nobody's praying for his church. I believe the spiritual condition of America at this moment is lower than it was in the revival of the 1700s with Jonathan Edwards. We've forsaken God, particularly we've forsaken the prayer meeting. What would happen if you had a choir like, say, you have at First Baptist or somewhere, I first Baptist in Dallas, or uh, Good Brothers First Baptist Church in uh, Atlanta. I, I stayed there a month once. You have about 200 people in the choir. What if only 10% turned up for choir rehearsal on Friday night? Do you think you might get the resignation of the choir master? But supposing a guy with 26,000 members had 10% come to the prayer meeting, he'd die of shock. <laughs> but you see, we have had people, last, just a year ago now, we finished our 500th prayer meeting every Friday night, and it was a prayer meeting. In most churches now, the preacher preaches Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, forget it. One of the young pastors that comes to us, he got moved by the power of God, he went to his church and said, look, I'm going to preach Sunday morning, Sunday night, but not Wednesday night, we're going to pray. He's in a country church, he went from 60 Wednesday night to 6. They don't want to pray. We had a prayer meeting where people drove 4, 5 and 6 hours. And there were people that came and they belonged to famous churches in, in uh, California. And they came over and said, look, we know why God's brought us in this area. We need to learn to pray. We went to a very popular church. It's attended by dozens, hundreds of film stars and others. But there's no prayer life there. But you know what happened? When they come three or four times, they quit. You know why? Because we had men that used to mumble in their prayers, and it pleased God to educate them in the spirit. And I would go on Wednesday night, I'd go Friday night. There was one full-blooded American Indian. He was dying in the gutter, snow falling on him. He was a victim of drugs and drink. And God awakened him, and he got wonderfully saved. And he got an anointing in prayer to hear that man pray for the American Indians. They're the most neglected people in America today. And, and the Indians somehow don't go after them. You can't go on the reservations, they kill you. All they say, listen, you stole our land, you stole our oil, you stole our mineral rights, you stole our fishing rights, get out of here. And I've told him, stay with it. Stay to your people, with your people. Don't let somebody else wear your crown. You see, some of us, we were walking around eternity, and God was going to put a crown on my head and I didn't do the job so he passes it to Dale. He's going to wear it for a billion years. Every time I see him, I say, that should have been my crown, but that's my fault. It's not the devil's fault. No man take thy crown. That's, that's a warning against deacons. But anyhow, <clears throat> don't let any man take your crown. God has given you a job, do it if you die. That's what it takes. Brother Leonard, what is the uh, nature uh, and the content and the direction of those prayer meetings. For the average layperson who has not been able to attend, 
Where do you begin? What do you pray for? What do you target? What happens in those prayer meetings that are so unusual? And what are the kinds of prayer meetings that we need to start having in our churches? Well, we'd have different target. I call it target praying. For instance, uh, one week we pray for all the uh, husbands of the wives or fathers of the children who are there whose daddies were not saved. Maybe not even church member. We concentrate on unsaved fathers, unsaved husbands. Another time we concentrate on teenagers. You see, there's something about covenanting in prayer. Uh, I went to Dr. Tozer's church, thank you, and uh, I stayed there for two weeks. And I had the privilege of praying with him. He's a wonderful man. He wasn't the greatest preacher I've ever heard. We had an intimacy with God like nobody else. And I remember one day he said, Len, don't let anybody diminish your appetite or zeal for prayer. He said, I'll tell you what happened in World War I. The finest young men in our, in our church went to war. They were drafted, 30 of them, and we covenanted with their parents and their wives. We covenanted in prayer that not one of those men would get killed or seriously injured, and every man came back. The only one that was lame was his own son. But he said, if we can covenant in prayer like that, why don't you, can't you covenant in prayer in your churches? Not one of our girls in our churches is going to get pregnant. Not one of our boys is going to go into drink. We're not just going to raise nice, healthy children. We want to do more than that. We want to produce spiritual offspring. And the reason those superstars that came to our prayer meetings didn't continue, well, they heard men that were praying with anointing. Again, they heard this fellow crying with tears for the uh, different tribes in America. It, it's astounding. There are, what, two and a quarter American Indians? Where's David Brainerd today? There isn't a Brainerd there. How do we have, how do we have a right to pray for revival when in the 20th century there are so many people who believe theologically that things are just going to get worse and worse and worse. Mm. And God <clears throat> certainly is not going to send a revival. So why are you wasting your time praying that God will send one? Well, you, you get a nucleus of people. You get together and talk with the deacons and others. When it says here, they have forsaken me, so what? How many of you deacons come to prayer meetings? One night I was standing on the platform with Charles Stanley. There were maybe uh, over a thousand people there. I think he has 50 deacons. And I said, Charles, where are your 50 deacons tonight? He said, well, I can count 15. I said, well, fire the rest. <laughs> what did they do in the upper room when the Holy Ghost came? They gave themselves continually to fundraising. Did they? What did they do? Give ourselves continually to prayer. I like the figure, I'm going to speak maybe one day, I think Hannah is the best type of an intercessor that I know. That all the qualifications, she had grief, she suffered, she mocked. And, and yet year by year, it wasn't once, they scorned her. But when she got pregnant, she didn't care a hill of beans about anybody. Well, let me say this too. I think there's a danger of seeking revival to justify my ministry, to prove we're the best people in town. Are we, mentioned it with Paul this morning. What does it say <coughs> in Malachi? The Lord whom ye seek. We're not seeking him. We're seeking revival. We're seeking healing. We're seeking miracles. It's not that we need. If we get God, we get all that's needed. Amen. And revival is when God comes down. Pick that book for me, please. Here's a little book I hope you'll all get. It's Come Down, Lord. It's a good book, of course. It's from England. But apart from that, get a copy if you can. It's published by. Yeah, should have a table. It's all right. Put it there. It's published by Banner of Truth. But I mark this page 23. Now this is revival. I think revival is the most prostituted word that we have in our vocabulary today. Either revival or faith. Uh, we don't know much about either. Revival stops the traffic. As dear Tozi used to say, Leonard, when revival comes, it, it changes the moral climate of a community.
taverns closed down, nightclubs closed down. It's, I mean, there's a war going on now. Dear God, if ever we need to put the whole armor of God, it's today. How many of you men have uh, the book, The Whole Armor of God by Gurnall? Do you have it? Let me see your hands. Oh, good. Only two out of all of you. It's a wonderful book. It's 1130 pages. It's $36. Uh, we can send the Nancy an address where you can get it for 18 It was written like most of the classics in the 1600s. And, and it's the most stirring thing. I gave Wilkerson a copy of that five years ago. When I came back, he said, Hey, while you were on it, we had a vacation in the Bahamas. We should be there now. We get a free flight and a free holidays. But this glorious atmosphere here, you know, where you can freeze every night is more attractive. <laughs> <coughs> so, uh, How do you address the people who say that we are living in a day and age where everything is getting worse and worse yes, and worse? Yes. There is no way God's going to send revival. Yes. Let's hang on for dear life and pray for the rapture. But you have no right to believe and to storm the throne of heaven in faith, believing that God is going to send a revival. He tells you in the Bible things are going to get worse and worse. How do you answer those people? Well, I answered it this week this way. Uh, when the world population was five million, did God love it? Yes. Does he love it less when it's five billion? If God isn't willing that any should perish when it's five million, is he more willing that many should perish now? You see, the trouble in the world today, the stagnation, the, the moral desolation in America, and the stagnation in America is not due to the strength of, of humanism, it's because of the weakness of evangelism. People don't get born again when they come to the altar. They leave it, they come damned and they leave it damned. They're not born. People can't be born in five minutes, put off ten million sins and transgressions and violations of the law of God. They can't change a way of life, put off the old man, put on the new man by just standing there in tears. As I told you last night, when I heard that guy say on TV, come forward, it'll Lord, take a few minutes. I went to bed and cried. I said, he's the leading evangelist in America, telling people who are dead in trespass, they're not bad, they're dead. The prodigal didn't say, my son is bad, he says he's dead. It's no fun to look on a congregation. Maybe I said yesterday, a hundred years ago, that great, that great art critic in England, what was his name, John? John Ruskin said, preaching is 30 minutes to raise the dead. I thought that was facetious, it's scriptural. All those lovely people you have, executive people, deacons, nice people, wealthy people, poor people, hippies, yuppies, what have you got? There they are. They're dead. And we're the ones that transmit life. But, uh, dear brother, I believe we're going to see a Pentecost that will have Pentecost, Pentecost. And I'll tell you what, nobody's going to stick his name on it. Swaggart's had his chance to evangelize the world, messed it up, all around us. They've had millions of dollars. What have they done? They've brought disgrace to the name. People ridicule it. But God is a jealous God. God's going to raise up men. I pray for Romania and behind the anchor every day of my life. People want to tell me now that God's bypassed America. Don't waste your time. Why? Wasn't it as dead in the days of Jonathan Edwards? What is revival? Well, I think it was an old American. I think, I, I think it was E.M. Bounds said that E.M. Bounds is the breath of God on a situation that threatens to become a corpse. We're very near death in America. There's no time for a new reformation in a denomination. It's going to raise up new men with new vision. I want to preach on vision tonight, God willing. And we've got to have vision and passion. You got, God's got to upset our whole schedules, our lifestyle, our way of eating, our way of living, our way of socializing in the church, God help us. Sure you can get a hearty church, if, if you put a chicken supper before the prayer meeting, they'll come for the chicken supper. You drop the chickens, you'll drop the crowd. Because they're all chicken, but anyhow. <coughs> I believe... If I didn't believe there's going to be an awakening. Okay. God has given me the privilege of knowing praying men. There's a little fellowship of people in a town called Zion, Illinois. You know where that is? And it's still there. 
there's one or two original people that were there with Dowie <coughs> and I went there, they asked me to talk with the man, he's upstairs in bed normally, he speaks with the mic to the congregation downstairs every morning do you know what happened to him? I walked in, he thanked me, he said, Mr. Hill, you do me an honour, I've read your books. I said, please, don't say a word. My mother said, if ever you go into royalty, you never turn your back. You, and when I backpedal to the door, I said, I want to thank you. Do you know that man, Andrews? God called him to go to uh, Israel, and he mastered Hebrew. And when he got there, God said, go back. He said, but people gave me my, do as I say, go back. Intercede for America, what did he do? For 30 years, he prayed from 10 o'clock in the night till 5 o'clock in the morning by himself. Mm. Oh, you talk about David Brin, and that was, I'm talking about our day, I'm talking about the one I talked with. When they carried him in his little wooden casket out of that room, it was the first time he'd been out of the house in 12 years, never out of the house. How does a man retain his fire? He's not only seen men are lost, men are not merely lost in your church, they're robbers. They're robbing God of the right to use their personality. They're robbing God of the right to use their time. They're robbing God of the right to use their tongue. Dear God, Saturday they, come, they shout till they're hoarse. They're frantic on Saturday at the spot to read the frozen on Sunday and here is a man he said listen I am not a bit weary and this is a staggering thing to me he said Mr. Rainer is going to be an awakening before Jesus comes and I, I forgot it till Martha reminded me the other day he said there's going to be a revival that will sweep one billion people into the kingdom of God well that's a lot but there are five billion in the world. Are the other four billion going to hell? There's a man around the country now. I don't know if... Uh, man, have you met Paul Kane yet? Well, Paul, I've ministered with him a few times lately. He's an amazing man. He, he used to get 30 and 40,000 people in his meetings. He deputized for Bill Branham. And then he disappeared. I heard of him in 1950 when I first came to America. I didn't meet him till about 20 years after. And then I met him recently. And he said in a meeting we're in, he said, God has revealed to me there's going to be a moving of the Spirit of God. And what? And one billion people will be born again. And he mentioned your country, dear brother. What do you call him, son? He mentioned your country. Those other countries are in the belly of Russia now, Latvia, Estonia. Lithuania, dear God, when I was a boy we had a family who used to come from Estonia. I think there were what, about ten in the family. They all played different instruments and they set our church on fire. Well, where did they disappear to? Dear God, you say, my church will never pray. Get some conditions from this brother about what's happening in their country. You know, the two most pleasant looking men in the world right now are the two biggest enemies of the cross. One is the Pope, another, the other is Gorbachev. And they fooled us. They fooled us. We may not have a collision with communism. We'll have one with Romanism. It's a deadly enemy because it says Mary is co-redemptrix and Mary is, is a mediator before God. But going back to this, there never has been a situation in the world as difficult as today. We've never had all the cults that we have now. I see the nations being squashed like this. This wall is moving in this way, it's cults. This way, wall is moving this way, it's the occult. And these things are rampant. My dear country of England again, in the last 25 years they've closed 600 branch churches of the Church of England alone, leave out the Methodists and others. But in the place of 600 churches we have now 600 mosques. The greatest revival in the world right now is amongst the Muslims. Why? Because they're prepared to die. You can't scare them. We're prepared to die. Our folk are not prepared to live. Sure, they'll come to a camp, they think, ride horses or have, uh, play tennis or some other thing. I know there's nothing wrong in that. But where's the passion? It's young men that see vision. I'm not trying to escape it. I want to tell you before God, I'm in my 83rd year now. I have a bigger fire burning in my belly, if you like, of my heart than ever in my life. 
And I'm determined by the grace of God to wage war. I must say, I've got young men coming 300 miles to our prayer meeting. That's my consolation. I know that Manley's stirring people in his area, Bill in his area. Still, God has a remnant, but the remnant is not enough. We've got to return to the old ways. The fire has to burn. Dear God, the prayer meeting has to become the most attractive thing in the church. You fire the deacons. If they, when I went to the last church, I was there and said, listen, every deacon has to meet me half an hour before the service, any meeting. So Friday night we meet at nine o'clock and pray till midnight. You would tell me about Spurgeon. Paul was showing me a little book the other day. Yes, sure he was a great man of it. Do you know in all the 20 years he was in that church, he never once made an altar call? Do you know what the deacons did for him? They went in the side room where he, he prayed and wept and groaned before God. Every time he went in the pulpit, the deacons put their arms under his armpits and carried him to the door to get him on the platform. One old lady that visited him, knew him, told me about his prayer life. It's amazing. And no man is greater than his prayer life. I don't care how many church members he has. Uh, somebody told me the other day, you like a favorite verse. I, I'm not drumming around a bit. But you know, I think the greatest honor, in, I don't have any doctorates, either begged or borrowed or burned or anything else. I have no degrees. You can have 32 and still be frozen. <laughs> <laughs> but there's one thing I covered. I want to be one of the 10 most wanted men in hell. I want the demons to say, Jesus I know and Ravenel I know. Jesus I know and Del I know. That's why the devils opposed him. Dear uh, Manly, last night moved to tears. I saw him come to the platform. I whispered in his ear after. I said, you and I have one thing in common when the Apostle Paul went in death soft. Dear Lord, my wife's been to my funeral half a dozen times or at my bedside. Lots of people like to see me die, but I'm not going to die, I'm going to live. <laughs> they actually threw a white sheet over me and the doctor said he won't last four minutes. And I, I was going to die piously and I had my hands folded and he said he won't last four minutes. I said, me? He said, oh! I said, you're talking about me. <laughs> then the doctor said, you won't, he said, by another 11 years from now you'll be crippled and paralyzed, your back's broken, your feet are broken, your legs are broken, you'll be useless. Well, I may be useless, but I'm still hanging on. But the thing is this, I've been privileged to share in prayer, and I don't remember great pulpits. I've preached some of the great pulpits of the world. I don't remember them. I've taught with great preachers. But when men have let me pray with them, I remember all of them. I can tell you how we pray. I remember Manly at the, what was the national conference we had in? No. When... Uh, no, when Beth, Beth, no, Beth, Bertha Smith was there. Brother J. Harold Smith? No, Bertha. Oh, Bertha Smith was there. Philadelphia. That night of prayer we had? Yes. We said have a night of prayer. And we got in the bedroom and, uh, boy, after about ten minutes, the door kept going out. And I thought, my, I'm going to be left by myself as usual. And phone weren't going out, they were coming in. So I looked around, there were about six pairs of legs, the guys were under the bed, the guys, like guys under the bed at that side, and at this side, and we prayed till, I don't know what, two or three in the morning. And somebody said, God came down that night. Well, that's where revival is born. You can't schedule it. The stupid thing, we're going to start a revival next Sunday night and finish there. Who, who gives orders to the Holy Ghost? Sensitivity to the Spirit of God isn't there. In the middle of the Welsh Revival, and remember there's a guy, 26 years of age, and he's already prayed 13 years for revival. He wouldn't allow people to photograph him. The greatest preachers in, America, in England were there at the time. William Booth was there. He left his office desk to go listen to this 26-year-old guy. The greatest Bible teacher in the world was there. G. Campbell Morgan, he left his office at Westminster and came to hear this young Welshman. F. B. Meyer came from the Baptist Church. They were all flocking to Wales to hear a man who was anointed in the Spirit of God. He comes into a meeting, the biggest hall in town had 800 seats. Everyone was packed an hour before time. 
And in comes the young man, everybody's waiting for him to come. There's one seat on the front. He went to the front seat, bowed his head, and he prayed for three hours. What do you mean? Do you think our congregation would do that? They say, hey, he's fallen asleep. For three hours. Until he felt the rich and not. Then he stood up and preached for 15 minutes. The glory of God came down. And did what happen? Nobody dare leave the place. He went out at 10 o'clock and prayed the whole night for the anointing for the next day. The people stayed till 2 and 3 in the morning. They did that week after week. You see, we take our little revivals to South America. Uh, what do you call him again? Swaggart went. He took the formula he had here. Turned it on at 6, turned it off at 7. It didn't do a thing. It failed. Because it was American? No, because it wasn't biblical. Uh, another big shot did the same thing. But the fellow is having revival in South America now. I was reading one report. It said they go to a meeting. It starts Wednesday. They have Wednesday night. They have Thursday night. They have Friday night. Saturday, Friday night. The people, particularly teenagers, pray the whole night through. Pray all day Saturday. Pray all Saturday night into Sunday. And the glory of God fills the place. You see, you've got to get an appetite. You know the nitty-gritty of the whole thing is this, we don't know God. We don't know God. We know theology, we know about Him. Why did Jesus come into the world? To save sinners. That's not what Jesus said. What did Jesus say? I'm come that they may know Thee. Every man that comes in my office, and I get them worldwide, I don't know why, but they come. And I say, first tell me, do you know God? Well, I have a degree. I didn't ask you about that. Do you know God? When was your last encounter with God? When were you last prostrate in His presence? When did you last sit spellbound at His majesty? You don't know God. Because we don't know God, we don't know how to worship. We don't know how to enter into His presence. We're content to know a few theological shibboleths that other people have taught us. Dear God, one of the leading men in the Southern Baptist Church, a very dear friend of yours, I won't give you a clue after that, my dear brother, he said to me recently, he said, listen, forget our seminaries. There's no anointing in them. Those professors are teaching the le lessons on Romans they taught ten years ago. You can shake the dust off them. And every year they go back and say the same thing. Romans is chapter 1 and then chapters 8 to 11 and chapters 2 to... to, to <coughs> Parrot can say it. How can men sit and hear the word of the living God and not catch fire? Amen. That's right. Our God is a consuming fire. I, hope, I don't know. What do I, what do I preach tonight? When do I, I'll preach tomorrow too or the day after. Mm -hmm. I have two more times, so maybe I'll get to preach on the incandescent man. I like that. And then on the indestructible man. Mm -hmm. You see, the blessed word of God, it torpedoes us. It says, Elias was a man of like passion. Have you noticed so often God says, I look for a man. Have you noticed in the middle of his great, the greatest poem ever written on love, 1 Corinthians 13, has 13 verses, he suddenly stops talking about love and he says, when I became a man, what does he mean? Tell me, manly, think it over. When did he become a man? What does he mean? When did he step out of spiritual infancy? When did he uh, move out of spiritual immaturity? When did that vision come? I want to preach on him one day before I go, I hope. Yeah, when you were talking last night about Hebrews 11, you know, I read that chapter as I tell you. When I read Hebrews 11, I follow my face because not one person in Hebrews 11 ever had a Bible. And when I've read all about achievements, I'd like you to preach on this sometime, Manly. There's a verse there that staggers me and it says what? It says, they did by faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. And then one verse says, not accepting deliverance. What does it mean? I'd rather die than fail Christ. You can't imagine it, can you? There's a woman standing over there feeding a baby. And the judge says to her, look, listen preacher, you take three grains of incense to that at the feet of Caesar and all you do is say Caesar is Lord you can go back to your darling wife and precious baby if not those lions are going to release them the next thing you'll find a lion chewing your baby up another one tearing the breasts off your wife do you love your wife? you tell me you're going to love a God you can't see 
to the wife and he stands there and watches it. We've forgotten all about that. There's a book called Fair Sunshine. It's about the young men that were put to death in Scotland until 1665. And as you read them waving their hands and saying, I have three more days before I see the king in his beauty. You see, what our generation of preachers have managed to do, we've failed to make sin diabolical, we've failed to make sin offensive, and we've failed to make sin attractive, uh, Christ attractive. You know, the only time you can sing the hymn of Wesley, Thou, O Christ, art all I want, the only time you can say Christ is all I need is when Christ is all you have. Amen. We're propped up with everything. Our refrigerators are full. I don't have many clothes, but I have at least, I have two suits at least. And I have at least two pair of shoes. I went to one preacher's place. He had 35 uh, uh, sports coats and 25 pairs of shoes. He had nearly as many books. <coughs> Does it? Does the devil care what we have? Yeah. All he's worried about is that you catch fire and then your church catches fire. And another thing I need to say this, I've gone round a bit, I know, but I've got to get wound up and say what I want to say. You see, the great revivals of Methodism were not in buildings, they were in the streets. The Salvation Army set England on fire. Wow. Not by buildings. The, uh, the Bishop of Gloucester said, don't ever let John Wesley or Charles Wesley in any of our churches. They were both certified men of impeccable morality, scholars, read the Hebrew and Greek. Don't let them in the churches. And don't let that man, George Whitfield, in the church at all. Tell me who was the bishop at that time. Nobody knows. Don't care a hill of beans. But we know the men that got kicked out. You know, some of you guys, if you're faithful, will be kicked out. At least that's my prayer. I pray you'll all get fired for being fired. Amen. But God's going to do it. Don't, don't lose sight of that with all I've rambled on. You see, God used the same material before. They were flesh and blood. Many of them were fallible. Paul was saying this morning, some of them made great mistakes. But God looks on the heart. And they were able to see great movings of the Spirit of God. America is harder today than she's ever been. We've no vocabulary anymore. Nobody commits adultery now. They just have an affair. There's no fornication. It's premarital sex. Nobody's messing with spiritism. It's just channeling. We've taken the sting out of all the words. We don't talk about hell. We've got to get back to biblical theology. That's right. And listen, we've got to do the essential thing. Jesus says, I, if I be lifted up, we're not preaching Christ. We're preaching drugs. We're preaching abortion. We're preaching crime. We're not preaching Christ. Our fathers, I've been reading very much lately again, the, uh, well, partly the apostolic fathers and the men up in the, the Puritans and the other people in that area. How they exalted Christ. It was Christ first, Christ last. You see, we've lost sight of the majesty and holiness of God. Mm. We don't tiptoe out of the sanctuary, subdued by God's almightiness and power and mercy. It's just a ritual, it's a formality. People know why we're going to start, now we're going to stop. But let's go back to the main issue again. The main issue, the church to vibrate. Boy, if I live within a hundred miles of this place, I'd be here every, I'd be here every week at least once to pray with these guys. I wouldn't pray in the day when it's coming to about 9 o'clock till 3 in the morning and see how men would come. They'll come. There's nothing more attractive on this earth than fire. Whether it's physical or spiritual, fire is the most attractive. Our God is a consuming fire. And the only answer to hell fire is Holy Ghost fire. Brother Leonard, let me ask you another question. And You make interviews very easy. This is my third question now. Um, what do you believe is the greatest hindrance to genuine revival in the church here in the West? The number one hindrance to revival in America is evangelism. Mm. We made it easy for people to come forward and say a little prayer and go out. 
stop them and ask, ask you ask teenagers in your church number one are you saved yeah from what oh from hell are you saved from lust are you saved from pride they don't know talk about the witness of the spirit that John Wesley preached on more than anything else they don't know what you're talking about they'll sing blessed assurance and they've no assurance the hindrance number one is we made it so easy for people to come forward they go out at the door, I watched some recently, they had to get out of the door, they were lighting cigarettes. They weren't going home under anguish. Do you not, dear, uh, what's his name again? Um, <coughs> Spurgeon said when he was 15, he was under conviction of sin for weeks and weeks and weeks. He couldn't sleep, he couldn't eat. When do you get conviction like that? Dear God, our people, they, they're a bit upset in the meeting, they go out, they go back to sin. They go back and sit before TV till midnight. There's no concern. There has to come an awakening in the church to the peril. Those loved ones of yours at the end of the table, they don't go to church. No, they're going to hell. Why don't you say it? My boy's a good boy. He's quarterback. Who cares a hell of beans? It's quarterback, a fullback, any other back. Where are your children? What's your ambition for your boy? I three boys, two of them, the, two of the best preachers in America today, the other one's the, the head of one, the new section in that multi-million dollar, what do you call it now? Smithsonian, Smithsonian <laughs> Museum. And, uh, and these boys, have, they, they got prayer lives, two of them it got tremendous prayer lives and then my joy. I would be totally unhappy if they were anything else. They'd never be millionaires, they'd never be rich. But they know God, they're laying up treasure in heaven. Amen. And our young people, you see, it's not a case of getting the family, getting the Bible back in the schools, get the Bible back in your home. We were talking, I was talking to your brother uh, Bill here about, um, what's his name now? Duncan Campbell. I spent many hours in prayer with Duncan Campbell. He used to pray and weep and groan. The amazing thing, Billy, I don't know, he never had revival except when he preached in Gaelic. I preached with him the first day of, I remember the first day of World War I, it was the 4th of August, my cousin went to the army, he came back crippled. I remember the first day of World War II, I was to preach at the head church of the Nazarene Saturday night. In the afternoon I went to a mission hall in the centre of Glasgow and I didn't know, they said, this is Duncan Campbell. And he was always known as Duncan Campbell of the Argyle Revival. I'll tell you about that to now, he lost his anointing and became nobody. But I said to him, well, what was the condition? He had what, revival 1949? He said, well, by the way, at that time, after breakfast in the morning, they lifted all the dishes off the kitchen sink, off the table, put them in the kitchen sink, and Daddy got the Bible, and he read a psalm, or a psalm usually, commented on it, and the children had to memorize the, uh, what do you call it, the uh, shorter catechism. You see, Maybe the greatest hymn writer we ever had was Isaac Watts. He wrote, When I Surveyed the Wondrous Cross. He wrote, Joy to the World, the Lord is Come. He wrote, We're Marching to Zion. Wonderful man of God. But do you know he had a catechism, catechism for children under seven years of age? And you couldn't move up in a, in a class in Sunday school until you'd memorized it. Then he had another catechism for children from seven to fourteen years of age. Then he had another catechism for people fourteen and up. What does a good book say? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. 